Thank you very much, Chairman, for your very kind uh, introduction. Now, first, I would like to thank the organizing committee, in particular Majid, for the invitation. This is my first time in Saudi Arabia, and I have the privilege to visit two very beautiful cities, uh, Riyadh, and now I'm in Jeddah. And all the people that I've met are very nice. So I actually love, love this country, and uh, thank you for the hospitality. Now, I am a colorectal surgeon, so today I'm going to talk about IBD surgery advances and breakthroughs. Now, to begin, I'd like to show you a case. It's a typical case that we manage in Hong Kong. So this is a 22-year-old gentleman, a smoker, good pass health, presented to a medical GI colleague with right eyelid force of pain, associated with diarrhea and also weight loss for one month. Both ESR and CRP are elevated. And then colonoscopy uh, subsequently found inflammations and ulcers in the cecum and alexical valve. And terminal island could not be intubated because of swollen island single valve. And biopsy showed a typical features of Crohn's disease with, you know, uh, granulomas. And, and therefore, our GI colleagues started this patient with a settled fork and also prednisolone. And meanwhile, CT enterocolysis was arranged. But about one month later, the patient was readmitted to the medical GI ward because of increased in right island forcing pain for one day, associated with fever. There was a tachycardia, chest x-ray did not show any infradiaphragmatic free gas, and white cell count was elevated. And then an urgent CT scan was taken, which showed a thickening around the terminal ileum and also the cecal region. And uh, now, up to this juncture, what are you going to do? Medical treatment or consult surgeons? Now, our medical GI colleagues actually started this patient with steroids and treated as a flare-up. The patient actually did not respond with increasing pain and fever, and therefore we were consulted. And then we saw the patient and we found that there was increased peritoneal signs, in particular over the erratic fossa. And then, oh, how come it becomes, okay. And then on a, and then we reviewed it, the CT scans uh, ourselves. And then what we found was, in addition to the thickened terminal ileum, there was actually pocket of free gas. So we made a diagnosis of allocecal Crohn's disease with peritonitis and also suspected perforation. So obviously this patient requires surgery now. And in most of the units, usually this patient will be subjected to laparotomy and then probably with an allocolic resection. But now we're in the minimal invasive surgery era. In Hong Kong, basically minimally invasive surgery is the standard treatment for all, almost all colorectal diseases, including IBDs. So we actually subjected the patient to an emergency laparoscopic assisted. Uh, it's not a right hemicolectomy, I would say it's an island colic resection. Just to show you a video clip here. So this is what it looks like, a lot of turbid fluids in the peritoneal cavity. So, you know, this is a flat one here with all the great momentum wrapping around the erratic forces. So, first, we try to mobilize the greater uh, momentum away uh, from erratic forces, just to expose the pathology. You can see this is a very swollen and thickened termed ileum next to the cecum. So, we went on to uh, further mobilize the greater momentum away from the erratic forces by using this very useful energy device. It's a bipolar vasocilla. All right, it's a very, it's got a blunt tip, so it's uh, particularly useful in patients with IBD because uh, for IBD patients, the uh, tissues are very friable, the messages are very thickened, and the bowels are dilated. So if you use very pointed instruments, there could be a risk of uh, uh, injury to the bowel. So, oops. So because of time, I think I'm gonna move on. Now this is the resected specimen showing you a very diseased uh, cecum and also terminal ileum. You cut open a specimen, this is how it looks like, all right, cobblestone appearance. So in fact, laparoscopy is highly desirable for patients with Crohn's disease. Because these patients are young patients, they are more concerned about cosmesis, body image, and also many of these patients are actually working. So that's why they need to return to go back to work early. So early recovery is important for them. And also for Crohn's patients, there's a high likelihood of recurrence and reoperation. So the fewer adhesions uh, after surgery, the better uh, for the subsequent surgery. In fact, if you look at the literature, there are 
many comparative studies trying to compare laparoscopy versus open surgery in treating patients with Crohn's disease. And this is a meta-analysis published in Diseases of Colon and Rectum in 2007. In this meta-analysis, 14 studies, including two randomized controlled trials, were included, over 800 patients. And what this meta-analysis found oops, was that laparoscopic arm actually took longer to perform compared with open surgery, but laparoscopy was associated with early recovery of GI function, shorter hospital stay, lower morbidity, and there was no difference in disease recurrence. So we did see some short-term benefits associated with the use of laparoscopy in Crohn's disease patients. Now, how about long-term outcomes? You remember there were two randomized controlled trials on this uh, subject, and in one of the randomized controlled trials, the researchers actually um, had a long-term follow-up of the cohort. So they reported the long-term outcome subsequently. So in this uh, long-term uh, outcome of this RCT, 60 patients were randomized, and the median follow-up was seven months, uh, sorry, seven years. And uh, they are mainly looking at long-term reoperation rate for recurrence, incisional hernias, and adhesions. Actually, recurrence was quite few all right, in, this, uh, uh, in this RCT, so most of the reoperations were actually for incisional hernias and adhesions. And uh, altogether, there were two patients who required reoperations in the lap arm versus six patients in open arm. So there were fewer patients in the lap arm who required a reoperation. And this is a couple of my curves. And other uh, uh, aspects that this study is trying to look at is the long-term uh, quality of life outcome. So the overall quality of life actually did not differ between the two groups, but if you look at a particular domain such as body image and cos cosmetic scores, uh, they were actually significantly higher after the lab group. So you can see in the long term, laparoscopy actually can confer also some benefits in terms of fewer adhesions, fewer additional, uh, fewer additional incision hernias, and better cosmetic outcomes. And because of all these short-term and long-term benefits, many of those who you know uh, management guidelines, uh, for example, this is from BSG, uh, stated that laparoscopic surgery appears to be safe and feasible in Crohn's disease patients and is emerging as a procedure of choice for ideal colic resections. Now, how about redo? Because obviously, you know, these Crohn's disease patients are going to come back with recurrence. How about doing a laparoscopic redo resection in these patients? Is it feasible? Now, this is an interesting paper from uh, the uh, hospice group in UK. They're looking at the experience of doing laparoscopic redo alcoholic resections in patients who have got previous laparotomies. So they have 29 such cases, and they try to compare with another uh, control group uh, that had no previous surgery. And what they found was there were actually no difference in conversion rate, operating time, and also blood loss between the two groups. And then they uh, looked at other parameters such as complications and length of stays. Actually, the, all these parameters did not differ between the two arms. Meaning that in experienced center for experienced surgeons, even laparoscopic redo alveolar color resections is feasible and also safe. Now, how about for ulcerative colitis? Now, this is a picture showing you how we actually take out the whole rectum and colon uh, in a patient with ulcerative colitis just by all these uh, few ports. So, this is a typical picture of the laparoscopic proctocolectomy. Now, laparoscopic surgery for ulcerative colitis basically is the standard, all right, nowadays in the elective setting. So, for all patients undergoing elective surgery for ulcerative colitis, we all do laparoscopic approach unless it has really an absolute contraindication. Now, how about for emergency setting like this, patient with a toxic microcolons? Sometimes we do have referrals from GI physician, you're giving them this kind of patient, grossly distended abdomen, toxic microcolon. Sorry for these patients, even, you know, we are very experienced in laparoscopic surgery, we could not operate on these patients using the laparoscopic approach. So some of the patients we know, uh, we cannot do laparoscopy. But how about those patients with toxic colitis, really emergency, without toxic microcolon? I think in this group of patients, laparoscopy is still feasible. So for us, we always do, for these patients, we always do a laparoscopic total colectomy, and also give the patient an ileostomy at the emergency setting. And then when the uh, condition settles, we'll go back into the two-stage composition proctectomy, and also an ileostomy pouch for these patients. So this is a study from uh, Cleveland Clinic, United States, uh, looking at the experience of total abdominal colectomy with ileostomy in, in, 
this group of patients with toxic colitis, and they try to compare about 200 patients undergoing lung approach versus about 200 patients with the open total colectomy approach. But and this, this is a retrospective comparison, so this is actually a, a non fair comparison because they, they uh, look at the lab group, the patients were actually younger and less ill when compared with the open group. But in terms of results, they, what they found was lab arm had, had actually long operating time, but less blood loss, lower mobility, and early return of GI function, and shorter hospital stay. But because you know the baseline actually, they are actually not comparable, so the researchers tried to adjust for covariates doing a multivariate analysis, and what they found was that lab, the lab arm, the lab approach was still associated with early returns of GI function and also short term hospital stay. And of course, a lot of comparative study, you know, looking at lab versus open surgery, proctocolectomy. So, this is one of the latest meta analyses, uh, including 27 comparative studies, over 2,000 patients. And what this meta analysis found was that lab had longer operating time compared with opium, but lab, lab arm had less blood loss, fewer wound complication, and also short hospital stay. And there was no difference in pouch failure rates. So you can see we have always been doing this laparoscopic approach for patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So that is our standard. We've been doing it for a long time. So what's really new in IBD surgery apart from just laparoscopic surgery? Now, research is a crazy animal. We are not just contented with minimal invasive surgery. We are trying to strive for a scarless surgery because the benefit associated with scarless surgery or no scars actually require no further introduction, you know, because there's no scar that would be reduced in pain, less wound related morbidity, reduced in immunosuppressions, and better cosmesis. Now, there are a few ways of doing achieving the scarless surgery. For us now, we are, apart from doing minimal minimal phase of multiple surgery, we can do single port surgery. We can do something we call NOSA, which stands for natural orifice specimen extraction, that is trying to extract a specimen through natural orifices. And finally, is a new development in the colorectal surgical field is transcendental surgery, and there's a kind of what we call direct types of NOS. Now, single port colorectal surgery means that instead of giving a patient multiple wounds, multiple ports, we can actually perform the similar surgery just by a single incision and put it in this what we call a single port device. All right. So by putting in this single port device through a small incision, we can put in a few instruments and then complete your surgery laparoscopically, just similar to a multiple surgery. But the difference is at the end, it gives you a very good cosmetic result. You can see basically virtually you cannot see a scar, and we're just headed. Uh, behind the umbilical case. If you look at the literature, there were reports of using this very new single incisional laparoscopic approach for treating both Crohn's disease and also patients with ulcerative colitis. And both these reports, you know, usually concluded was that uh, this single incisional laparoscopic approach is feasible and safe with a lot of cosmetic benefits. Now, another way of achieving, you know, a scalar surgery of, you know, trying to reduce the wound is by good surgical planning. Because, you know, for patients with ulcerative colitis, after doing allopalgenia and anesthesia, anyway, you need to give your patient a stoma, right? So why not, you know, you put this single port device through this, you know, uh, proposed temporary adiosomy site, finish your surgery, and then you can actually retrieve the specimen through this adiosomy site without giving your patient an additional incision for specimen extraction. So essentially like this, we make a small incision over this intended adiosomy site for this patient, and then we put in a single port device, and then we put a laparoscopic instrument, you do mobilization, resection, and after that, you take away your device, and then you can extract the specimen through this ileostomy wound, and then at the end, fashion an ileostomy over this region without the need of giving a patient an additional incision. So this is another way of, you know, trying to reduce the overall number of scars for this patient. And of course, I mentioned about natural orifice specimen extraction. All right, so apart from re retrieving a specimen through the stoma site, in selected patients, we may even extract a specimen through natural orifices, like the anus, when ladies, vaginas. So this is a picture showing you transcendental extraction of the proctocolectomy specimen. Um, uh, this is a kind of note. So, so uh, at the end, you don't need to give the patient an additional incision for specimen extraction. Now, another very interesting area of development uh, in, in orectal surgery is um, uh, it's, it's a transanal surgery uh, approach to proctectomy. Because we've been doing a proctectomy, we call top-down, either open or laparoscopy for a long time. But there are problems with laparoscopic proctectomy because when we try to dissect very deep down into the pelvis, we try to mobilize the distal rectum, 
it is extremely difficult technically because of anatomical constraints, because of the uh, confinements in the pelvis. So when we try to dissect very deep down in the pelvis, it is often difficult. Tissue planes are not clear, and there can be risk of injury to autonomic nerves. All right. Now, so that's why over the last 10 years we have developed this new approach of dealing with rectum. This is what we call a transanal proctectomy, or we call a bottom-up proctectomy, a down-to-up approach. Now, with the help of all these single port devices, we can make use of this device by putting it into the anus of the patient, and then put a laparoscopic instrument, and then we can actually mobilize a whole rectum, and then excise it, and then retrieve it transanally. This approach actually allows us to have easier access to the very distal part of the rectum with a better view. And this is, you may not know this gentleman, his name is Professor Bill Hield. He is actually the father of modern rectal cancer surgery. He is the one who pioneered total mesorectal excision. And even Professor Hield believed that this transanal, transanal proctectomy approach can overcome some of the uh, uh, problems associated with the top-down approach. So this is a cartoon showing you how I actually perform this transanal proctectomy. So you can see this is the transanal device. We put a laparoscopic instrument and then we reset, mobilize the rectum and resect the rectum transanally. So in essence, this is something like a natural orifice, transluminal endoscopic surgery or a direct nose. Now, in fact, we'll look at the literature, the very first report using this transanal proctectomy approach in treating the patient ulcerative colitis actually appeared in 2016. It's quite recent. So it's a 32-year-old lady undergone open total colectomy with anilostomy for toxic ulcerative colitis. And the patient now six months later is going to receive a complete completion proctectomy. So in this case, reported surgeons actually used this transanal approach and successfully performed the surgery. Now, this is another paper published in Colorectal Disease 2016. It's again, all right, it's a patient who had undergone a uh, total colectomy and uh, adiostomy, and then now this patient is undergoing a second stage completion proctectomy with a pouch formation. So first you see the surgeon actually resected the adiostomy, and then put in, this is the single port device through the old adiostomy wound, and then mobilize a bit more around the terminal ileum, so as to allow you to have enough length to fashion this ileal pouch, all right? And then afterwards, the, pick, the surgeon put back the device with a laparoscopic instrument to do a bit more mobilizations of the rectal stone. And then after that, they prepare the perineum by putting in this, uh, we call lone star retractor to retract the anus. And then first we put in a perstrate to close off the lumen to reduce contamination, all right? And then they start with mobilization of the rectum transanally, all right? And uh, so you have seen all the different approaches of MIS, single port, nodes, and, no, and, and also nodes. So uh, this is a paper from uh, Barcelona, but we're actually trying to combine all these concepts together and trying to standardize a way of treating patient ulcerative colitis. For them, they propose actually a doing a laparoscopic total colectomy and then with transanal removal of the colon, the specimen, this is nodes, with then aliosomy as, as, as the first stage, and then a down to a proctectomy as the second stage, doing completion proctectomy, and then fashion a pouch for this patient and doing aliosomy at the third stage, aliosomy closure. So this is what a combined MIS nodes and also nodes. Now we mentioned about laparoscopy as a standard approach, so we have been doing it for a long time. Laparoscopy is good, has a lot of benefit, but that is, that is also associated with a lot of shortcomings, all right? So it's another film showing you how we actually perform laparoscopy. This is for cancer patient, all right? You can see we're using all these straight instruments, which doesn't look like a human wrist. And you can see trauma associated with it. So obviously, I also have a surgeon operating, so that's why you can see a lot of trauma. So you can see these are the drawbacks of conventional laparoscopy, unstable camera platform. Uh, limited range of motion of the straight instrument, magnifies travels and poor ergonomics. All right, and this is also a picture showing you how I actually perform a single port surgery. All right, you can see we're using a single port device, but this is a very difficult surgery for surgeons to, to learn because you can see all the instruments are very crowded together, so it gives rise right, right to a lot of clashing, collision between the instruments. So these are the drawbacks associated with single port surgery. But now we are in the robotic surgery era, so can the robot help to overcome all these technical challenges? Now, in fact, you know, robots actually has a lot of benefits, including it gives you, you know, excellent optics, 3D magnified view, 
and also it offers you this kind of precision and dexterity, all right, by allowing you to do very good, you know, suturing. And with a robotic arm, you can actually do complex tasks like this, all right, doing a Japanese origami, all right, folding a paper crane, all right. So all these are advantages of robotics. Now, nowadays we're applying more robotics, not just in the past we're doing using it for cancer, but now we're extending the, uh, the, uh, the application of robots to treat IBD patients. So application of robotics, are uh, usually these are the indications, including in respiratory proctectomy and allopouch, because by using a robot, it can facilitate rectal dissections in a deep pelvis. It is also suitable for patients with Crohn's disease by doing allocolic resection, because it allows manipulation of bulky and thick mesentery and possibility of intracorporeal anastomosis, and finally for strictureplasty, because it allows you to do very good robotic surgery. Because of time, I think I need to move on. So this is a, one of the latest paper, uh, looking at the use of robotic-assisted allocolic resection for Crohn's disease, uh, compared with open surgery. This is the United States a national database, looking at over 3,000 patients, and then 100 patients underwent robotic, over about 2,000 underwent open surgery, and they did a propensity score matching. At the end, they tried to compare 108 robotic articulate resection versus 108 open. And what they found was that robotic surgery had longer operating time compared open, but it is associated with shorter length of hospital stay and also lower complication rate. So last few slides, apart from te technique, there's also advances in the technology. Because this is one of the newest and latest robotic platform from the initiative company, and that is what called the DaVinci SP system, and that allows you to do very good single port surgery and also transoral surgery. And uh, we've got this system, so we are the first group of surgeons in the world to use this system in treating our patients with colorectal diseases. And uh, this is the address of using this single port system. And at CUHK, we're also developing our own uh, flexible endoscopic robot. So that allows us to do endoluminal surgery like ESD for patients with IBD or dysplasia, single port surgery, and also transanal surgery. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I would like to say that IBD patients have a high likelihood of both surgery at a young age and also multiple reoperations. And there was certainly needs an aim at minimizing operative trauma with best post-operative recovery. Minimal invasive surgery techniques have been one of the major advancements in IBD surgery in the last decades, but latest technolo technological breakthroughs and, and developments in single port surgery, transanal surgery, and even robotics will further enhance surgical outcomes of IBD patients. So with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.